Thanks for joining me today to talk about a drug that's been used for more than 50 years, acetaminophen. Since it was first introduced for pain and fever, acetaminophen has become the most widely used analgesic antipyretic in the United States. It's got a good record of safety and efficacy when used appropriately, but in the past decade or so, we've seen a a really big increase in the number of cases of toxicity due to overdoses and also misusing the drug. Now, acetaminophen is a component of more than 600 over-the-counter and prescription medications. According to the Food and Drug Administration, more than 25 billion doses of over-the-counter acetaminophen are sold each year. It's sold as a single-ingredient product over-the-counter or in combination with other ingredients to treat symptoms of allergies, colds, upper respiratory tract infections, migraines, sleep disorders, and some other conditions. It's sold as pediatric tablets or liquid, adult strength tablets and liquids, and it's sold in several different strength formulations, such as regular strength, extra strength, and also extended release uh, products. To treat more severe pain, acetaminophen is combined with opioid analgesics in a, a number of prescription products, and it's also sold in combination with some other prescription drugs such as muscle relaxers. There are more than 200 million prescriptions of drugs containing acetaminophen each year. The combination acetaminophen and hydrocodone products have been the most frequently dispensed prescription drugs in the United States since 1997. According to a study that was published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, there's an estimated more than 78,000 emergency room visits each year due to acetaminophen and approximately 500 deaths each year due to acetaminophen. Now, of those deaths, about 69.8% are considered to be self-directed violence, so in other words, suicide attempts. 16.7% are for what we call therapeutic misadventures, usually overuse for medicinal effects rather than using multiple acetaminophen-containing products or dose confusion, although we do know that those can be problems as well or reasons for overdoses. And according to this study, about 13.4% of the ER visits were due to unintentional ingestions by children under the age of 6. Now, here are some uh, scenarios or some cases, very typical of what we would hear at a poison center. The first case is a two-year-old that's found with an empty bottle of children's acetaminophen and red liquid around her mouth. So it's pretty obvious the child had gotten into the, uh, the liquid acetaminophen. The next case is a four-year-old that's given acetaminophen containing over-the-counter products by mom as well as dad and also the babysitter uh, without a, a communicating to each other that they've given the uh, acetaminophen containing products. The third is a 16-year-old boy that's ingested 50 acetaminophen extra-strength tablets in a suicide attempt. And then the last is a 62-year-old man with worsening back pain that's been taking Vicodin, about 8 to 10 tablets per day, and also extra-strength acetaminophen, 12 to 16 tablets a day for a few weeks for his pain. A landmark study that was published in hepatology in 2005 really brought out the point that many of our liver failure patients and, and patients that require liver transplants are um, requiring these livers because of acetaminophen misadventures or some other type of problem with acetaminophen. Uh, this study looked at uh, um, transplant centers between 1998 and 2003, 22 centers to be exact, and they identified 662 acute liver failure patients. 42% overall were at those uh, transplant centers due to acetaminophen. In 1998, that percentage was 28%, and then it increased in 2003 up to 51% of those cases being due to acetaminophen. Of the acetaminophen cases, 48% of those, so almost half, were unintentional overdoses. 63% of those were cases where the patient had been taking just too much of their acetaminophen, opioid, or narcotic combination drugs, and about 38% uh, had taken more than one acetaminophen product. The uh, acute liver failure group, which also did the first study, went a little bit further in looking data a little bit um, in 
later years. And they looked at 23 transplant centers over a 10-year period, and they found that 50% of those patients were still there due to acetaminophen overdoses. And about 50% of the acetaminophen cases were unintentional overdoses. 55% of those acetaminophen cases were cases where only over-the-counter drugs were taken. In 29% of the cases, only acetaminophen and narcotic combinations were taken. And in 15% of the patients, they had taken over-the-counter drugs containing acetaminophen as well as prescription products that contained acetaminophen. We can also look at poison center data and see that, that this problem is increasing. Uh, as you can see by this graph, the number of calls to poison centers in the United States concerning acetaminophen is on the rise and has been on the rise since about 2000. And uh, acetaminophen opioid combination products are leading the way, and that would be the pink line at the top, followed by products that just contain acetaminophen, the green line just underneath. With adults, um, most of the cases are acetaminophen opioid products, and with children, they're mostly acetaminophen alone. More than 60% of the fatalities that are reported to poison centers are with the acetaminophen opioid combinations. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the opioid itself can also contribute to the death. Data that was published in the journal Drug Safety in 2012 showed that between 2001 and 2008, there were a total of 119,731 cases involving acetaminophen opioid combinations, and that had increased 70% over that period of 2001 to 2008. More importantly, there was a 500% increase in cases with severe hepatic injury. When looking at acetaminophen without an opioid, so acetaminophen alone products, a total of 126,800 and some odd cases were identified, and that had increased 44% between the years of 2001 and 2008. There was a 134% increase in cases with severe injury. The authors of this study also noted that hepatic injuries are increasing faster than the population in product sales. So that suggests that people are self-dosing themselves above the, the toxic threshold. The uh, increase in liver toxicity is greater in the acetaminophen opioid products, and this sort of relates to the, the problem that we're having now with the misuse and, and abuse of these particular drugs. There are many reasons for overdoses for with acetaminophen products, and when we look at children, um, most of them are unintentional ingestions or unintentional overdoses, but we also do have uh, problems with therapeutic errors where parents are giving double doses or uh, misunderstanding how to give the uh, acetaminophen product. Uh, in one study, um, only about 40% of parents and caregivers could really determine the correct weight-based dose of acetaminophen despite having all the package labeling available right in front of them. Fortunately, in this particular study, most of the cases were under dosages rather than over dosages, but certainly there were some that were also over dosages. And it just kind of points out that um, a lot of people don't really understand how to give medicines even when they have the package labeling right there. About 65% of those patients also said that they had given Tylenol to a child, but only 8% said they used acetaminophen. So that shows that people don't associate the word acetaminophen with Tylenol. They don't really understand um, the generic name as compared to the, the brand name. Also, there are dosing con confusions because of the uh, markings that are on the dosing devices, and that has been a particular problem with not only acetaminophen-containing products, but also cough and cold products in, in the past. And so we're uh, moving towards having more standardized markings on dosing devices, such as medicine cups as well as syringes that are used for pediatric products. And another problem that we sometimes have is that parents sometimes will turn to adult products if pediatric products are not available in the home. And again, they don't understand how to dose it. Uh, particularly with the, on the label, there won't be any recommendations for children's dosing on uh, the adult products. With adults, we see a number of reasons why 
we um, hear about overdoses and toxicity as well. First, we will see some intentional overdoses or suicide attempts with acetaminophen because it is readily available in, in most homes in the United States. But also a reason would be because of the, the uh, huge amount of prescription drug abuse that we're seeing now, particularly with the opioid and acetaminophen combinations. And along with that, the same products are creating problems because of intentional excessive dosing for pain. So they know better, they know what's written on the label, but they're just taking too much of the um, acetaminophen uh, for their pain. We also see some therapeutic errors. Uh, in one particular case or one particular study, 500 clinic patients in a waiting area were interviewed, and they were shown different products that contained acetaminophen, and they were asked how many of those they would take to reach the maximum dose. They were also asked about taking other meds that contained acetaminophen. So overall, 23.8% of those participants showed that they would overdose on a single over-the-counter acetaminophen product by exceeding a dose of 4 grams in a 24-hour period. And 5.2% said that they would, or it was determined that 5.2% would make serious errors by dosing out um, more than 6 grams. In addition to that, about 45.6% of adults demonstrated that they would overdose by taking two acetaminophen-containing products. So let's take a, a, a few minutes and talk about the toxicity of acetaminophen. It's important to understand why it's toxic, how it's toxic, what happens, and then also the treatment of acetaminophen overdoses. So acetaminophen is metabolized primarily by the liver, but it also, um, under normal circumstances, is conjugated with a glucuronide, about 40 to 65 percent of acetaminophen, and another 20 to 45 percent is conjugated with sulfate. Both of those compounds are non-toxic, and they're eliminated in the urine. About 5 to 10 percent of acetaminophen will be metabolized by the cytochrome P450 isoenzyme system, mostly by the 2E1 isoenzyme, and but there's also some 3A4 involved, and it's metabolized to an active toxic metabolite. Now, that metabolite, we call it NAPQI, N-A-P-Q-I for short, because the long name for it is N-acetyl-para-benzoquinonamine. So we uh, like to shorten that to NAPQI. Now, NAPQI is usually detoxified by conjugating with glutathione that we just have normal uh, stores of glutathione in the body, and then it's eliminated by the kidneys. However, with a large amount of acetaminophen, the glucuronide and the sulfate pathways become saturated, and the metabolism then gets shifted to this cytochrome P450 pathway. So more acetaminophen is metabolized to NAPQI. Now, eventually, the, your glutathione kind of dries up. It gets depleted. And when the glutathione stores are below 20 to 30 percent of normal, this NAPQI will accumulate, it binds to hepatocytes, and it leads to hepatic necrosis. The toxic doses for acetaminophen vary depending on whether you're talking about a child or an adult or acute ingestion or chronic ingestion. Uh, small children actually um, are somewhat protected against the hepatic effects or the toxicity of acetaminophen. First of all, they usually don't ingest as much as adults, and also they metabolize acetaminophen differently, producing less hepatotoxicity. The acute toxic dose for a child is greater than uh, or equal to 200 milligrams per kilogram, and with older children and adults, the toxic dose would be 10 grams. With a chronic ingestion, it depends on how long they've been using the drug. It also depends on if they have risk factors that we'll talk about in just a moment. So in general, for if the patient's been taking the, the medicine for 24 hours or less, then um, about 10 grams per day or 200 milligrams per kilogram uh, per day in a child would be toxic. For a time period that's greater than two days, then that lowers to about 6 grams per day or 150 milligrams per kilogram per day, whichever is less. And if the patient has risk factors, then we lower that to about 4 grams per day or 100 milligrams per kilogram per day. And it's important to realize, again, that there are risk factors, and, and the um, recommended daily dose is going to be less than that 10 grams or 6 grams per day to take into consideration that there are going to be people that are going to become toxic at lower doses. So the risk factors for toxicity include pre-existing liver disease, 
There are cases where shorter courses of acetaminophen, as little as one to two days, have been linked to the potentiation of their liver disease. Also, chronic alcoholism. Chronic alcohol use stimulates the cytochrome P452E1 activity, and it also inhibits the rate of glutathione synthesis, and so you get an increase in toxicity. Also, alcoholics and, and others who may be malnourished have depleted stores of glutathione already. Uh, for alcoholics, as little as 3.7 grams per day for three days has produced toxicity. The significance of all this um, as far as alcoholism is, is not all that clear. So in most cases, we assess and treat the patient as we would with any other patient. Patients with AIDS may have reduced glutathione stores, and fasting may increase the risk by also depleting glutathione stores, fasting as well as starvation. Uh, and so you will see an increase in toxicity in, in those patients. Also, the chronic use of enzyme-inducing drugs, the 2E1 enzyme-inducing drugs, and that would include phenobarbital, isoniazid, rifampin, and carbamazepine, and there are a few others as well. The clinical course of acetaminophen toxicity is generally broken down into four phases. The first phase usually occurs uh, somewhere between 0 and 24 hours after the ingestion, if it's an acute ingestion. And the patient usually just has some GI symptoms. There's no evidence of hepatic injury at all. So they might have a little bit of nausea and vomiting and anorexia, might be a little sweaty. And that's usually about it. If their blood tests are, or if blood tests are taken for liver function tests and, and coagulation, studies such as an INR, all of those are going to be normal in this first 24-hour period because it does take time for the acetaminophen to be metabolized and it takes time for your glutathione stores to be depleted. Phase two occurs somewhere around 24 to 72 hours after an acute overdose or maybe longer with an, a chronic overdose. And this is where you start to see the onset of the hepatic injury. The GI symptoms, if they were apparent, will usually improve. But then you start to see right upper quadrant pain and tenderness as the liver becomes enlarged and, uh, and tender. And this is when you'll start to see an increase in their liver function tests, their AST which is also known as the SGOT, the ALT, also known as the SGPT, bilirubin, and also their, their INR, so their coagulation studies. Phase three is about three to five days after the ingestion, and you start to see the full-blown effects of the hepatic dysfunction. So they become jaundiced, they have coagulopathies or are bleeding, they may go into a coma due to an encephalopathy and cerebral edema, they can develop a metabolic acidosis, renal failure, um, up to 50% of those with hepatic failure will also develop renal failure, and also this is when their peak liver function tests and INR are usually seen. If they survive phase three, patients will usually recover. Uh, they recover fully, and labs will normalize somewhere around four, five to seven days after the ingestion. Here is the RUMAC Matthew nomogram. This was developed in 1975, and this nomogram predicts the risk of toxicity in patients who have an acetaminophen concentration drawn four or more hours after ingesting acetaminophen when the absorption is likely to be complete. Any blood drawn prior to four hours after the acute ingestion cannot be used because absorption is still ongoing and can be erratic. The serum concentration, or the vertical axis, is plotted on the nomogram for the time post-ingestion that it was drawn, which is at the bottom of the nomogram. And there are two lines on the nomogram. The top dashed line is based on patients who, are, who, who will develop an AST or ALT greater than 1,000, and that's usually the definition of hepatic toxicity, not hepatic failure or death, but hepatic toxicity. So the line was actually decreased by 25% arbitrarily. That was an FDA requirement, and we get that solid line. And that line's predictive of probable risk, accounting for maybe inconsistencies in the history or, or patient risk factors. If either of the acetaminophen serum concentrations are in the shaded area, then the patient is at risk for hepatotoxicity and should be treated with the antidote. Um, we usually get one hour uh, or one level, and then four hours later get a second level. Now, this nomogram can only be used if, the, um, if it's known when the ingestion occurred. It can only be used if it's an acute ingestion, and we need to make sure that, the, that we're familiar with what units the level is reported in. Uh, to use this, we need to convert or, or know that the units are in micrograms per milliliter. 
Now, this is a case of a chronic overdose patient. Um, this is a 28-year-old male with a history of hepatitis C and alcohol abuse that presented to the emergency department with right upper quadrant pain and vomiting for two days. He's been taking six grams of acetaminophen a day for two weeks. His AST and his ALT currently are 360 and 489, and his acetaminophen level is 35. Now, in this case, it's possible that his AST and his ALT will continue to rise and his acetaminophen level will continue to decrease as it becomes metabolized. Uh, but it, it points out that you can have a, a relatively low acetaminophen level, and if it's a chronic overdose, you still can have patients with hepatic toxicity. Now, the antidote for acetaminophen overdoses or acetaminophen toxicity is acetylcysteine. And acetylcysteine acts as a glutathione precursor and substitute. It also provides the sulfhydryl groups that are available for sulfate concentration or conjugation, rather. And if it's given later on in patients who have already developed hepatic failure, it can actually serve as a free radical scavenger and act as an antioxidant. So you can get some improvement in hepatic cell function even if it's given late. It's indicated if the patient has a toxic acetaminophen level or if there's a history of a large ingestion. If the um, patient has hepatotoxicity due to acetaminophen already or even patients who come in that have an unexplained elevated AST or ALT, then we often will treat them just under the assumption that it could be acetaminophen. It's important to realize that the more you delay the administration of acetylcysteine, the less likely it is to be effective. Now, that being said, we will give it many hours later, but preferably it should be given within 8 to 10 hours of the overdose. Acetylcysteine can be given either orally or by the um, IV route. And there really is not a good consensus among clinicians on the best way to treat an acetaminophen overdose as to the uh, the route of administration or the duration of treatment, and even on the dose. There's even some disagreement or difference of opinions on the dose. The oral uh, acetylcysteine, also known as mucamist, or most of the time it's generic right now, uh, was approved by the FDA in 1985. It is, again, most effective when started within 8 to 10 hours of the ingestion, but it can be used later. It can be used in chronic ingestions, and it can be used if hepatic toxicity is already developed. The dose is 140 milligrams per kilogram as a loading dose, and then 70 milligrams per kilogram are given orally every four hours for 17 doses. So that puts you up at a dose of about 1,330 milligrams per kilogram given over 72 hours. Now, we do know or, or we do feel that some patients really um, can go with a shorter course of therapy. They don't really need the 72 hours of acetylcysteine. And these are patients generally that have not ingested massive amounts of acetaminophen and patients who have come in early on after the ingestion. And so in some cases, we can cut the therapy short to maybe 36 hours or even 20 hours. Uh, that might be sufficient. But we need to assess the patient based on the acetaminophen level. We want to make sure that it's negative based on normal liver function test and INR, and if the patient looks well. But I would encourage you, if you work in a hospital, um, encourage your staff, clinicians, to call your regional poison center to make that assessment. Don't just rely on what you think might be a, a proper or appropriate amount of, of acetylcysteine to give the patient. It's really important to get the poison center involved. We recommend diluting the acetylcysteine to a 5% solution or less, so usually in soda or juice or something like that. Uh, the adverse effects generally are pretty mild um, in that they're not life-threatening. We can see some nausea and vomiting. Uh, it, they can be a problem, though, because you're giving this antidote orally, and if they start vomiting and they're not keeping that antidote down, then the antidote is not going to be effective. So if the patient does vomit, we do recommend giving them antiemetics. And if they vomit it within one hour of the administration, then we recommend repeating the dose. Another option is to give intravenous acetylcysteine. Now, currently it's under the brand name of Acetidote. However, that will be coming out as a generic brand shortly if it has not already. And acetidote or acet intravenous acetylcysteine is um, given in three separate doses. It's given as a loading dose of 150 milligrams per kilogram over one hour. 
Then there's a first maintenance dose of 50 milligrams per kilogram over four hours. And then the second maintenance dose is 100 milligrams per kilogram over 16 hours. So that gives you a dose of 300 milligrams per kilogram over 21 hours. There are some adverse effects. There's not a high... Um, incidence of adverse effects, but some people, especially patients who have asthma or a history of bronchospasm, they may develop some flushing, they may develop some itching. There are some patients that have developed angioedema and even more severe uh, allergic type of reactions such as respiratory distress and hypotension. If those adverse effects occur, then in some cases we can just add on maybe diphenhydramine and keep the dose as is. We may need to stop the acetylcysteine, treat the patient, and then restart it. And it may need to be restarted at a, at a lower rate uh, so the patient is not getting quite as much dose as they, they would have been. Most of these uh, ad adverse effects are going to occur with the loading dose because that's where you're giving such a, a, a much larger dose of acetylcysteine compared to the maintenance doses. Now, in some cases, actually a fair number of cases, we need to continue the acetylcysteine greater than 21 hours of, of therapy. And this is usually in patients who have ingested very large amounts of acetaminophen or patients who you may be giving the acetylcysteine to a patient who had a chronic ingestion of acetaminophen because they cannot tolerate the oral root of uh, acetylcysteine. So in some cases, we need to give a longer course of therapy. And so we do recommend repeating some lab work prior to discontinuing it and continue it if the acetaminophen level is still positive or if their liver function tests are not improving. Again, I'd recommend calling the local poison center, your regional poison center, so that um, you can make sure that your patient is meeting certain and very specific criteria to determine whether that patient can be discontinued on the acetylcysteine or continued with acetylcysteine. Now, this is a case of a patient where the acetylcysteine was dis discontinued too soon. This is a 78-year-old that ingested 96 tablets of extra-strength acetaminophen. Her acetaminophen concentration at two and a quarter hours was 264 micrograms per milliliter, and that's very high if you that's not a peak level. That level was rep repeated, but um, in any event, that's a pretty high level. The IV acetylcysteine was started at five hours post-ingestion, so it was started within that eight to ten hour window where you'd expect it to be effective, and it was continued for 21 hours and then discontinued despite an acetaminophen concentration of 116 micrograms per milliliter. So this patient actually did develop hepatotoxicity and coagulopathy and renal injury, and so acetylcysteine was restarted 24 hours after it was discontinued. The, um, it was continued uh, for a while. The aminotransferase levels or the enzyme levels, the, his coagulopathy and the renal insufficiency gradually normalized, and he was discharged on hospital day 12 with all of his lab values at baseline levels. Now, we've realized that there are a lot of IV acetylcysteine administration errors, so it's important to be familiar with the dose and the administration of IV acetylcysteine to try to prevent these errors from occurring. In one study, uh, a study that was done in the UK, 66 patients had been receiving IV acetylcysteine. Now, keep in mind that IV acetylcysteine was being used in the UK much longer than it has been here, so they were very used to using uh, acetylcysteine IV. And they actually took the bags and they measured uh, the acetylcysteine in the bags to see how accurate the um, preparation was, and they determined that less than 40% of those bags had acetylcysteine concentrations within 10% of the intended concentration. And the concentrations actually varied from 0% to 305% of the intended concentration. So there were even bags where there, were, there, were, there was not acetylcysteine. They, I guess, forgot to put it in there. And in 9% of the cases, the, the uh, concentration varied by greater than 50% of the intended concentration. Now at our poison center, we did a study looking at patients who were receiving IV acetylcysteine and we determined that 33% 
of those patients had administration errors. And some of the errors include delays in hanging the bag, so there were hours in some cases between, say, the loading dose and the first maintenance dose, or the first maintenance dose and the second maintenance dose. There were calculation errors. There were errors in that it was being used inappropriately when it was not needed, and there were a number of other types of errors. So 33% administration errors, that's a pretty high rate and, and something that's really not acceptable. So it's important for pharmacists, again, to be familiar with the dose and to try to catch these things and, and make sure that um, doses are being sent up as uh, timely as possible. Now, there are cases of acetylcysteine overdoses, uh, particularly IV acetylcysteine, and um, some of these patients have had some pretty serious uh, effects from the toxicity of the acetylcysteine. In one case, a patient received doses that were measured in milliliters per kilogram instead of the milligrams per kilogram. Uh, in this particular case, the clinician actually misread the columns in the table that was on, or that that was in the acetidote prescribing information. And so the patient received a five-fold overdose. And this patient developed hypotension, hemolysis, and hemolytic uremic syndrome. There was another case report in the literature of a patient that received a very high dose of acetylcysteine because the dose was ordered as 50 milligrams per kilogram per hour instead of 50 milligrams per kilogram over four hours, and then 100 milligrams per kilogram per hour instead of 100 milligrams per kilogram over the 16-hour period. And this patient developed delirium, cerebral edema, seizures, and permanent brain injury. So now let's talk about what's been done to try to prevent toxicity and overdoses and what we can do. Uh, first, a little history as far as what the FDA has done and some of the um, manufacturers as well. In 1998, the FDA required that all over-the-counter acetaminophen products include an alcohol warning. Now, this warning stated, if you consume three or more alcoholic drinks every day, ask your doctor whether you should take acetaminophen or other pain relievers or fever reducers. It also included a warning that acetaminophen may cause liver damage. In 2002, the FDA convened an advisory committee meeting to discuss unintentional liver toxicity re related to the use of over-the-counter acetaminophen, and this committee recommended that there be a liver toxicity warning on labels, also recommended that there be an education program, and um, there, there was an, an FDA-led education program following this recommendation, but the education programs in general, not just with the FDA but elsewhere, uh, were very few and, and not very successful. In 2004, the FDA launched a public education campaign to help consumers use acetaminophen more safely, but again, this was considered small due to budgetary uh, constraints. In 2004, the FDA sent letters to every state board of pharmacy asking them to consider requiring uh, that you spell out acetaminophen on labels instead of writing APAP. That's a, a big concern in um, confusion among whether products have acetaminophen in them. And um, also inst instruct patients to avoid concurrent use of other acetaminophen-containing drugs. Also to instruct patients not to exceed the maximum daily recommended acetaminophen dose and to not drink alcohol uh, when they're taking these prescription drugs with acetaminophen. Um, unfortunately, as of February 2008, at that point in time, none of the states had implemented regulations related to this request. In December of 2006, the FDA issued proposed regulations for OTC labeling for acetaminophen-containing products to require new safety information uh, and also that the container and the outer carton identify acetaminophen as an ingredient. In June of 2009, the FDA assembled more than 35 experts for a two-day meeting to discuss ways to prevent overdose with acetaminophen, and this is what they came up with. They decided that the maximum single dose should be 650 milligrams, down from the 1,000 milligrams that it was at that time. The committee also decided that 500 milligram tablets should be prescription only, so extra strength acetaminophen should be prescription uh, only. And that 
was sort of a big deal that they recommended that because close to 50% of the single ingredient products sold over the counter are the 500 milligram tablets or were at that time. They also recommended decreasing the maximum daily dose from 4,000 milligrams. They didn't really come to a conclusion of what it should be, but to decrease that maximum dose. They also recommended that prescription combination products that ha contained acetaminophen be eliminated or that there is a black box warning if they didn't want to go with that uh, recommendation to eliminate those combination products. Also, they recommended unit dose packaging for prescription products and also one over-the-counter liquid uh, product concentration. So in 2009, the FDA also uh, required that the word acetaminophen be spelled out on the front of the package of over-the-counter products, so it would be a little bit more clear. In January of 2011, the FDA did limit the prescription products to 325 milligrams per tablet or, or dosage form, uh, that there be a boxed warning on the product, and manufacturers had three years to comply. In May of 2011, there was a joint meeting of the non-prescription drugs and pediatric advisory committees, and they came up with some recommendations. They recommended that infant acetaminophen products be labeled for fever only, that dosing on all children's products be based on weight and not on age, that the packaging be changed to prevent unintentional ingestions, that the measuring device that came with the packages be clearly labeled in milliliters using the, that standard ML abbreviation, and that the solid dosage forms for pediatrics be only in one concentration. Remember, previously the uh, a committee recommended that liquid dosage forms be one concentration, and now this committee was re recommending solid dosage forms for pediatrics as well. In May of 2011, the manufacturers that belong to the Consumer Healthcare Products Association, uh, they agreed to limit liquid pediatric acetaminophen products to a concentration of 160 milligrams per teaspoonful or 5 milliliters, and that would eliminate the infant drops that were much more concentrated. In July of, of uh, 2011, McNeil took it upon itself to lower the maximum daily dose of the extra strength Tylenol tablets to six tablets per day or 3,000 milligrams per day. The maximum dose of the 325 milligram tablets was uh, 10 tablets per day or 3,250 milligrams, and the maximum daily dose of the extended release or eight hour Tylenol, the 650 milligram tablets, uh, was set at uh, 3,900 milligrams, so uh, six caplets per day. Here are some other actions that have been taken or s some other associations that have gotten into the act. In July of 2010, 2010, the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy recommended that state boards of pharmacy prohibit the use of APAP on labels and spell out acetaminophen instead, and the association offered to work with pharmacy groups and the FDA to help with implementation of the rule. Also in um, 2011, the National Council for Prescription Drug Programs recommended that Again, the acetaminophen should be spelled out on all prescription labels of products that contain acetaminophen. They also recommended that a standard concomitant use, so using uh, or not using other drugs that contain acetaminophen, and uh, liver toxicity warning labels be applied to these products. So what's happened since then? Well, in January of 2013, the uh, National Council of Prescription Drug Programs reported that pharmacies and pharmacy groups are complying with this recommendation. And they report that at least 45% of the U.S. retail market has implemented these recommendations as far as spelling out acetaminophen and, and the warning labels. And some big chains have come on board with that. When some other chains um, come on board and also some pharmacy system software companies come on board, these are chains and software companies that have already started working on implementing the same recommendations. So when they come on board totally, then that will bring that up to 75% of the U.S. retail market. So we've really come a long way as far as uh, eliminating the use of APAP on labels 
uh, and trying to help with confusion and knowing that that APAP is the same thing as acetaminophen. Now, sometimes we're asked, so why not make the 500 milligram tablets prescription only, like the FDA advisory committee recommend it? Well, there really is little evidence that it would actually reduce the number of cases of liver toxicity. We don't know. We don't know if that would have an effect at all. It's uh, hypothesized that patients might take three or more of the 325 milligram tablets instead. And so the question is, will they be more likely to take too much acetaminophen and develop the hepatic toxicity? Or would they transfer their use to other toxic meds? Will they use large amounts of aspirin? Would they use large amounts of uh, non-steroidals? That could be a problem also in their own right. So that's why nothing's been done yet as far as making the 500 milligram tablets prescription only. Another question is why not limit the size of extra strength acetaminophen packages? Well, this was done in the UK and for acetaminophen or extra strength, they, they have to be sold in packages of 16 or less in non-pharmacy establishments or 32 tablets or less in a pharmacy. This is shown, depending on what area of the UK and what study you look at, it's shown little or no reduction in liver failure cases. And this is also inconvenient for patients and it may be costly. So there are some concerns about limiting the size of the packages. So what can pharmacists do? Well, first and foremost, don't use acetaminophen on, or I'm sorry, APAP, APAP, or even ACET on labels. And I know that there's challenges to this. It requires new software. Will there be safe a space on the labels? Acetaminophen is a long word, but it's extremely important to be clear about what the ingredient is in that particular product. And be aware of your state board regulations. It may be a requirement to do that. Use warning labels for using other drugs that contain acetaminophen as well as liver toxicity. Check patient profiles for multiple sources of acetaminophen, and if you do notice that, alert patients and also alert their physicians. Look for potential interactions with drugs that induce the cytochrome P450 system that might uh, increase toxicity, such as isoniazid. Watch for opioid tolerance. If you notice a patient might be increasing their use of prescription combination products, kind of jump on that, counsel them to the, the fact that the acetaminophen could be toxic to them if they're taking too much. Warn about acetaminophen toxicity if the patient is a known alcohol user or the patient has liver dysfunction. And it also helps to educate patients by putting in-store signs or flyers or brochures or some way of trying to educate the patient. And while we're on the subject of education, it really all comes down to education. Most of the common reasons for overdoses and toxicity are due to a lack of patient education and awareness about acetaminophen products and proper dosing. So these are some things that you should educate your patients, you should counsel your patients on. Carefully read all drug labels to see if they contain acetaminophen. And don't forget about cough and cold meds and other types of preparations also that might have acetaminophen. Never give or take more than one over-the-counter medicine containing acetaminophen. Avoid acetaminophen products if taking prescription meds with acetaminophen. Uh, one interesting study evaluated discharge instructions to determine whether patients given prescriptions for acetaminophen containing narcotic analgesics received appropriate instructions to reduce their intake of or stop taking other acetaminophen products. And of 108 patients who were discharged with a narcotic analgesic combination product with acetaminophen, none were instructed to reduce or discontinue the use of acetaminophen products. And that's very important. None of them, zero, were instructed to not take over-the-counter products or other acetaminophen products. So it's really up to us uh, as pharmacists to educate patients to avoid the um, acetaminophen products if the patient is getting a prescription product with acetaminophen. Uh, they should be told also to not take more than is recommended. 
make them aware that an acetaminophen overdose is a medical emergency that can result in liver damage or death, and that they should call their physician, call their poison control center if they suspect that they've been taking too much. Some other tips for education, particularly um, when we're talking about pediatric ingestions or pediatric uh, products. Instruct parents to give the proper dose for the child's weight and age, particularly the weight. These products are dosed by weight now. They should measure liquids accurately and use the given dosing device. Don't use a kitchen teaspoon, for example. That can vary from anywhere from 2 milliliters to 10 milliliters instead of the 5 milliliters that you want to use as a dosage. And store safely away from small children to avoid unintentional overdoses. Also advise parents to discard infant acetaminophen drops. Although they're not on your shelves, they may, they're not being made any longer, they may still be in, in uh, patients' homes. And then lastly, there are some resources that you can do, go to to help with educating uh, your patients. First is knowyourdose.org. It's an acetaminophen awareness coalition that has a plethora of education materials that you can get to help educate your patients. A lot of information on there for your patients. Also, FDA.gov, they have a national education campaign for consumers and health professionals, so there's a lot of information there. GetReliefResponsibly.com, which is by McNeil. There's also information on there on dosing instructions, using acetaminophen safely, a list of medicines that contain acetaminophen. Talk about rx.org and mustforseniors.org. These are two websites from the National Council on Patient Information and Education, and they include safe acetaminophen use guides and materials for various populations, including college students and also those who work with teens and seniors. And the NCPDP, that uh, has recommendations for how to keep people safe from uh, overdosing on acetaminophen. So it, it's aimed at industry, it's aimed at pharmacists, pharmacies, uh, what you can do to help prevent accidental acetaminophen overdoses. And then lastly, please uh, make sure that your patients do have the poison center number available to them so that they can call the poison center in the event of an overdose or a suspected overdose. Uh, your poison center can provide you with telephone stickers, magnets, and other materials that you can give to your patients so that they do have the number readily available.